Hi, I'm Brian Tyler. Uh, I'm a composer of music. Isn't that obvious? I think so. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you're at the site, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I'm Brian Tyler. Uh, welcome to All Access. We're going to be talking about a lot of things. Uh, the music for Crazy Rich Asians and Formula One and Yellowstone and all sorts of things. So, welcome. Well, Brian, thank you so much uh, for inviting me back to your studio. It's so great to talk again. Thank you for having How me. How have you been? Good. It's been great. It's yeah, been busy. It's been staying busy. That's yes. Good. yes. <laughs> no doubt. Um, so, to start, uh, I know we've, we've done many interviews in the past, but I kind of want to kind of touch back on your kind of background and, and your past of becoming a composer, you know, for people maybe who, who don't know the story, but what was that kind of point in your life where you thought, all right, this is my career, this is the path I'm going to choose, and where, where in your life was that moment? Yeah, I mean, I've been doing music as long as I can remember, so, mm -hmm. the, you know, I listened to a lot of different kinds of music. I loved film scores, for sure, like, that's one of the first things that I remember, you know, asking my parents, can you get me the Star Wars album, kind of, that type of thing. Um, but then again, you know, I also loved jazz, I was a drummer, so I loved rock and, you know, Rush and it's all, all sorts of stuff. And then piano, I was really drawn to classical piano. As young musicians tend to like, they like the fancy stuff. So it was like Rachmaninoff and Chopin and, is, you know. So, so kind of my young musical language was a convergence of lots of things. Um, a lot of it was, you know, influences from my parents, you know. It's like Motown. And then what was going on at the time, you know, I was growing up hip hop and, you know, and kind of industrial music was big. And, yeah. and, uh, and so as I went, I just kind of, that, I started writing music and something that I really loved doing was writing kind of programmatic music. I would read a novel and I kind of would write, I would sit down at the piano and I'd write music for it. And I don't know when it occurred to me like, oh wow, I could actually make a career out of this at some point. Because I started playing music professionally pretty young, mm -hmm. doing gigs, but I was a drummer or a pianist or a guitarist or whatever on... And um, so it wasn't until later, really, that I thought, I was in my teens at some point, I think, where it occurred to me, wow, wouldn't that be cool if I could do what John Williams does? That was really yeah. the, the template. And, um, and, and so, you know, it, it really wasn't that long afterwards. I, you know, I was in the music industry, and I was slamming away, and it just happens to be that my music got you know, pulled a song I wrote, got pulled into a movie as the main title, and the, some music that I'd written that was classical music was going to be pulled in the movie. So I said to the producers and the director, like, you know, why don't I, why don't give me a shot at scoring this thing? Yeah. And, uh, and one thing led to another. And, and here we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, your grandfather was also in the, in the business. He was then... in the film industry, yeah. yeah. So and You have a nice little... Relic. Yeah, there's an Oscar yes. right behind yeah. it. And yeah. uh, so he, like, he was, a, I think, a nine or ten times nominated that's amazing. art director. And he, th the thing that's interesting with that is that I, I learned lenses. I learned how to edit. I learned blocking and storyboarding yeah. and all the non-film scoring stuff right. from my grandfather just because I was fascinated by stories of him on the set, you know, like with the Ten Commandments, parting the Red Sea, and how did you do that? And you yeah. know, matte paintings and long lenses and all this stuff. And so at the same time, I I had this love of cinema and the the not just going to the movies, but how they were made. Yeah, I wanted yeah. to know how the magic happened. I wanted to know stop motion animation, which I learned. I wanted to know model building and and all that. And but it was his wife, my grandmother, was a classical pianist. Mm -hmm. So when I would hang out with them in the summer, you know, I would get this influence of rock music and all this from my parents. And then I would hang out with them and I would learn, that's where I learned Chopin and, and Tchaikovsky and, 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 and all that. And then at the same time, kind of the technical skills yeah. of, of cinema. And so it, it, in a sense, it makes sense. I just, I, I didn't put it all together at the time. Yeah. You know. So, but I mean, yeah, it all came together and right. it, it clearly... You're the product of that. That's yeah, it's uh, yeah, it definitely. Uh, it's the, being around it was a huge boon, and the and the the fact that I'm so just naturally interested in music and writing music and yeah. and narrative in general. Um, yeah, it, it's a it's a good home for me for sure. And 
I always felt that your music has, and it kind of makes sense just from your upbringing and spending time with your grandfather and, and knowing this kind of rich history of, of film, your music has an old soul. I mean, you, right. have, you have this great energy, and this is a compliment to you. Know, <laughs> but, yeah. like, yeah. You, you know, you're kind of this uh, you know, part of this modern movement of like, orchestral yeah. modern throwback yeah but yeah. it just feels it has like an old soul in there and yeah yeah, so. yeah I, I think i mean that was what i cut my teeth on you know mm -hmm. it was you know alex north and bernard herman and uh, you know uh, jerry and john and and uh, although it's, it's funny because i was interested in electronic music as well yeah. and, and scores and too have, vangelis yeah. and tangerine dream and brian uh, dan and, and brian eno and, and i love those scores but i almost like like to keep them s separate at the time i thought uh, interesting programming of keyboards that's one thing but to me when i would write i really loved writing pure kind of orchestral or live mm. music and i think maybe part of that was because i've been a instrumentalist all my life mm -hmm. and I just kind of I came into the scene when samples became very popular yeah and I'm kind of notoriously anti-sample <laughs> and anti-midi and like I do everything kind of the old you know I don't like quantization and, and kind of I, I don't do I like I don't really use midi except that it's a transmitter to trigger something like I, I it's just I'm a I, I, I like keeping it human. I like the mistakes and yeah. or, the, or the the slight errors that are in between the notes. So when you're playing a line, and you and you maybe even when you're doing a mock-up or whatever, or you're playing a piano part, if you do it in the box in the computer and you play a sampled piano, and you play a sampled timpani, and then a sampled whatever, and then you you play it kind of loosely and you just go, oh, I can fix this in the computer, mm -hmm. and you highlight it all and you quantize it, so everything's perfectly like metric yeah. and on the line i think that starts to take away from the human feel it's those little p playing a little ahead or a little behind or a little bit softer on this note and a little louder on this one that it all comes together and it creates this you know tapestry it just keeps it organic yeah, yeah. and and flowing and kind of like just live yeah. and so as as much as possible i boy even when i do kind of electronic music i do it that way yeah, yeah. um but certainly that's why I love conducting and that's why I love always pushing to record um, live orchestra. But it even goes beyond that. There's a certain kind of stylistic way of harmonization and, mm. and, and kind of te the technical part of the writing that you would definitely say I'm old school because in terms of the if, the, the, if there's kind of a continuum of kind of atmospheric chordal music over here that's you know kind of a wall of you know and then you have kind of melody based themes over here i, I definitely it is it is traditional but I, I i just tend to pull that way naturally but i i love both i you know yeah. there's yeah. a lot of my favorite scores are atmospheric and choral oh, yeah yeah you know and they move me but but somehow and, and when i do that stuff it's like kind of a it's like a fun thing it's just my natural instinct is to write a leitmotif yeah you also have, I mean, I think you have a very interesting education as well. So you did your undergrad at UCLA mm. and master's at Harvard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And your master's, what was it in again? It was... Not in music. Exactly, right? <laughs> that's, that's the but one thing. it was thing. something in yeah, psychology yes. or something? So, yeah, philosophy, history. Philosophy and, and history. Yeah, and that's undergrad and, and grad right. and studied education and, and all that. But I ended up with a master's degree. And yeah, it, it was weird because... It was really cool. Like yeah. I, I really enjoyed it, um, and I enjoyed my undergrad as well. But what I was doing while I was there, I would moonlight at night, and I go to the practice rooms where the pianos and the drums mm -hmm. and the cellos and the guitar. So any anywhere there were instruments, I I always managed to have a key to the music department, just by having friends that were in the music department. I wasn't <laughs> supposed to have a key, but I I, I did a lot of study, um, and even at UCLA, world music. Um, orchestration, things like that. I I just enjoyed. I I did. I actually did uh, piano at UCLA, and I, everyone in piano was a piano major, or you know. And here I am, like you know, <laughs> from the other side of campus. Yeah. So it was great. It really. Um, I was in the gospel choir, percussion ensemble, gamelan group, old American music. Uh, this this I, all. It's just anything that I could learn. And then at, at Harvard. 
Um, in the winters, it's a little harder. It's a little harder to get from my dorm. I'm from, from California. It's really cold. <laughs> so I had, I had like a keyboard in my room. But I kept working. I was Rapid putting my way it. through. Yeah, I, I, I was doing session work and I was making a living doing, you know, I would play live gigs. Anything, yeah. anything to kind of keep it going. And, um, and, and so, yeah, it, but people were surprised from, they knew I was a musician, but then kind of when you have that one or two years later, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, you know, I'm doing this film scoring thing. And they're like, what? You know, it was kind of a, kind of a trip. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I think philosophy is such an interesting uh, subject. Uh, yeah. I think it honestly strangely translates into what you do because you're telling human stories. You are, yeah. it's, you're, it's such a part of humanity, uh, well, the human it, condition. It, it is. And, and it's, and it's, you know, I've managed to kind of in my life been fortunate to take the impractical and make it practical you know mm -hmm. um, the things I learned about um, ethics and uh, metaphor and it, you know it covers a large you, you do a lot of literature you do a lot of right there's it's you, you know you even do in that there's I was fond of logic and diagramming and, and it got into math and, uh, and yeah. so you, you know all those things, and, and I'm a big, I love math, and, and so, and it's, being a musician, I think that usually they go hand in hand, you kind of love literature and na narrative and storytelling and art, but then you kind of have this thing about numbers, you know, yeah. that, and, and, and for me, it all made sense, and, and none of this was wasted in a sense, um, every day, kind of what I learned, and what I try to continue to learn in all these subjects, every day I'm studying something and <laughs> something outside of film you yeah. know um and it i think it, it for me at least it it gets me outside the just the darkened room of sitting mm -hmm. down with your piano and it kind of you get input from the rest of the world and you need that feedback it's ammunition it's like ammunition yeah. to translate that into whatever your yeah. story you're telling you yeah. put it in your music uh, and it invariably i do that with uh, the thing you can't control is that you have things in life. You have tragedies. You have mm. you have uh, high moments. You have yeah. all sorts, of, and that all goes into music. And I think that's all good. I think I, I think the more you can kind of rely on your experience and your emotions and your heart to come up with the the basis of a melody and the basis of the music is really important. And you kind of use your brain to translate that into the music so it can be heard. Yeah. I mean, you, you need both to, yeah. to kind of effectively maneuver and I think translate what's hopefully an original piece of music out into the world. Do you think that you are a better composer now than you were when you were younger because you've lived more, because you've experienced more tragedies, more joys, more highs and yeah, lows? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think so. I've learned, and, and also I'm, I am one to always be a student of things. So I've learned so much. I've yeah. just learned so much from other music over the years that I've deconstructed and thought, hey, how was that done? Well, that's an interesting chord. What yeah. the heck's going on here? Or I discover a, a, a different culture's music that I never even heard before. All those things, I think, help. The one thing that I, I, I think is important to, um, to, to not get stuck, which you sometimes see, in, in music writers in general, mm -hmm. is that you have to constantly challenge yourself to not be satisfied with where you're at, and think, oh, you know what, I'm I'm awesome. Like you, you 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 really need to make sure that there is a hunger there, and I I think that goes with all Anything. things in life. If yeah, you're comfortable. I'm, that means you're yeah not I, moving forward. I, I'm like. very. I I think the I think to the best statements that, that that anyone could make that can help them in life are I don't know and I was wrong mm -hmm. and um, and for me and that goes with a lot of things I phil philosophically politically um, uh, I, I'm very very different than how I grew up right uh, there was a point in my life where I kind of had to examine just um, w where I stood on certain big issues and, and, and kind of perspective of where I stood and I realized, wait, I was 
kind of over here because I learned these things, but I hadn't figured it out for myself. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, I had to say, you know what, all that time, I'm not gonna like dig in my heels. All that time for the last decades, I think for me, I was wrong. Yeah. Like I, and so that kind of willingness to ad admit that, I think opens up your mind to learning. And the only way to get better is to learn, you know? So uh, it's a value that I, that I hold on to. Right. And, um, and I, I think being challenged is, is, has helped me in that way to, I think, become a better composer. And in terms of, of course, failure always leads to growth. And, and uh, I was actually gonna ask about this because when, you, when it comes to the work that you do, you do have to fail in order to find what's, I think, correct. And anybody, and, but sure. It, but when it comes to the job that you do, I also think that there has to be some sort of confidence in there for you to do what you're doing. Yeah. And my question is, do you still have self-doubt or is confidence natural to you now mm. versus when it was maybe when you're younger, when you're like, oh, I don't, is this the right decision worth now? It's sure. like, I've done this before. It's kind of muscle memory, but like you still have to, do you still have doubt? Like when yeah, you yeah. start a project? I mean, um, I th it's a different kind of doubt. Uh -huh. um, I, I, you know, I've been around enough in the film industry um, and that uh, the things that I see repeat that are exterior, mm. the, kind of the drill yeah. of producers are probably going to tend to do this, studios are probably going to want this, they're probably going to want this, and, 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 you know, the movie's probably going to run late, and you got to do it in this amount of time, you're not going to sleep, blah, blah. That, that, I'm so used to that. Yeah. But that doesn't have anything to do with my creative process. Right. So I'm totally confident in, in, in that world where I don't even, where I'm, I'm not confident, I guess, or there's room there. Yeah. Is that is 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 can I write something better than the last thing I just did? Mm -hmm. And that that is kind of a self motivation. And the cool thing about writing for films is that you get every project gives you an an inherent set of restrictions. Yes. It's like yeah. if I was writing an album out of the blue and I was a solo artist I would need to find some thematic idea, like what am I going to do on this one? Is it going to be like uh, uh, dark or uh, you know? And, and I think just the cool thing is, is that the more restrictions that you have, in a sense, it makes you be creative. Yeah. I mean, just like the last example, Crazy Rich Asians, right? Mm -hmm. um, beautiful movie, really moving. It's funny too. It's incredible drama. And then there's a, a, a romantic side. And then we started talking about it. And here's the, the challenge and the restriction. You know what? At the same time, it's a contemporary tale. And I think the, the novel is contemporary, what Kevin wrote. So I think the knee-jerk reaction would be, and, and originally, by no fault of anyone's, I was, part of, I was part of the conversation, but with the studio and everyone. Right. It's gonna be, it's a, it's a contemporary rom-com with drama. So let's do contemporary instruments, maybe guitar and a key, mm -hmm. some drums or a beat. And it, I think that's kind of the, when you think of it, then you see what John filmed. Yeah. It's like a Technicolor throwback film. Even though it's contemporary, it looks like larger than life, like West Side Story, you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. so let's ditch that idea. And the, the new restriction is throwback music. Let's record the score as if we could take a time machine back to 1945 and it would sound exactly the same if we recorded it then. But here's a twist. We want to maybe throw in an Asian flair. Mm. Why don't we blend Chinese flutes and, and woodwinds and, and Western? How, why don't we use some erhu instead of violin? Like, how are we going to do that? But also have it be jazz. You know, like, the, yeah. so the, it ended up being this incredible challenge, but I would have never set up those restrictions on my own out of like thin air. Yeah. So it kind of, that, that part of the creative process is so important and it's almost like I can give credit to the film itself for getting that ball rolling. And then I've become very confident in, because it's fun for me mm. to, I want a challenge like that, you know? Yeah. And that's why I've been working on a lot of projects that are outside, I think what people think of me as the wheelhouse, which is big fantasy action, sci-fi superhero, you know? Kind of music and and doing this other thing because it it brings a different set of challenges which brings a different 
kind of spark to my everyday writing process. Yeah, because you've taken a break a little bit from the, the big budget things for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's exactly. And, uh, it, well, especially a certain kind of genre, you know, yeah, yeah, um, right. and... And that, I'll be doing plenty of that. I'm sure. You know, I'm not going to, you know. <laughs> but at the same time, I wanted to make a conscious effort to be like, okay, I'm not going to do this one and this one. This I would like to. But as with anything, even if you're unfortunate enough to be pretty established, you know, which is strange to me still. But, it, and I remember hearing Elmer Bernstein talk about this at one point, where there are, you kind of have these times, no matter who you are or whatever, that you that you kind of are known as a, as a certain kind of genre. Mm, yeah. And and you tend to, it's like a momentum thing. So you do something and then you get plucked to do a film like that because it's safe. Right. Oh, you just did this other superhero thing. What about this super, or whatever, which is, which is good, but you want to mix in other things. And, and at the beginning, I was doing these quirky, tweaky indie films, drama, like kind of some yeah. dramas that were chamber string music I did a couple of movies that were jazz scores and then these quirky, almost horror, science fiction things with guitar. You know, like it just, it was a really odd mix. So when it, when the studios, when I had a friend that was going to go direct a bigger budget movie and go to a studio, then it, you know, it becomes the, hey, Brian does these weird quirky indie <laughs> scores. Can he do an action? I don't know if he can handle that. And then all of a sudden, yeah. uh, you know, two years later, I'm the, the action composer. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so... So, it's a conscious effort to say I want to shake it up. Because you, you don't want to get typecast. You don't. Want, I mean, you don't want to fall into that you, pattern. You will get type. But yeah. I, it's the the good thing is that if you're willing to take the chance and say no to projects, yeah, that you, you you can't. One thing you can never do, like I would say to composers, and it's just it's. I'm not just saying this. Like you cannot chase the money. Mm -hmm. Like. It, it, if you want to, if you want to be satisfied with your own creative output, right? Don't do it. Um, you 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 need to follow who you want to be in battle with. So I I pretty much I choose my projects based on who's making them and right. and who. Life is short too. You want to work with people that you really like to work with and kind of bring out the best in you. Uh, John Chu is definitely one of them. He. Um, we just really work great together. Taylor Sheridan is another. Yeah. Um, you know, and I have a list of people. So I'll follow them into battle. Yeah. And that's, I think, I mean, you see that more where, I mean, the uh, ultimate one, of course, is John Williams and Steven Spielberg. And yes. So you see these, uh, the composer-director relationship, I think, is so special. And it's not just the composer, but if you look at the cinematographer and the costume designer, you see these teams going through their careers together. Yeah. And, um, and you're, like, on a bunch of teams. So it's like, yeah. as a composer, the cool thing is you're, you know, if there's the sports analogy, you know, you're you're really on many different teams. Yeah. You know, you're on the Lakers, you're on the so so, uh, and and I feel fortunate to be able to do it at all. You know, um, but at the same time, at this point in my career, I want to do things that or I sit back and I say, okay, I've actually grown mm. after this last movie. I learned something. I challenged myself. And I made something I'm proud of. That's at the end of the day, you know, for me, what matters. At different points in my career, I had different thoughts. Yeah. At one point, I was like, I just want to be able to go to the theater and go with my friends and my family and have, like, it say, music by Brian Tyler just once. Yeah. And I'll be happy. I'll n I, I'll never ask for anything it's again. Like, yeah, it's like it's like you rub the genie bottle and you're like, okay, okay, you got three wishes, and 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 then that of course like lasts for like you know three hours, and then and you're like, okay, well now I want to do a movie that is whatever this, and then you want you know, and so you, if you chase that, it can get kind of weird and strange, mm -hmm. and, and so you kind of have to reset and go, okay, it's about the music. How am I gonna do something? Whether or not anyone ever even hears it. Yeah. Like I do a lot of things that here at my studio that no one will ever hear. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing them to just do them. Like, I'll make music that I know no one's gonna, or I'll do an alternate, I'll score the scene in an alternate way that I know that's gonna, would never be accepted by the studio. Will you ever <laughs> present it to the studio, or just do it for your own fun? I have. <laughs> uh, so, so now I do that more. Um, <laughs> it, it, I'll, to, now if I do it, I pretty much always will show the director. Will they say yes to the absurd one? The crazy thing is, is in the last like <laughs> year or so, they almost, it's it's pretty much been yeah the one that I thought was the one that wasn't going to be used is the one that they went for wow um, 
And and to their credit, like th that's another reason I really love working with John to kind of talk about Crazy Rich Asians. John Chu is the is the rare person that sincerely you can get into a, a, a friendly creative debate mm. about wanting the best for a scene, and he isn't thinking past what you're. I'm trying to describe why I think it's this is so, and I, yeah. I would like it this way. He's not thinking about his response. He's actually listening to what I'm saying. Like, yeah. you can tell. If I stop, he doesn't jump in, and he'll, like, just go, yep, yeah, okay. Yeah. And, and he'll, like, hmm, okay, I'll think about that. And then there, I remember there were two, two significant things in Crazy Rich Asians um, that we had to talk about that we definitely disagreed on. And, he, and, and this went both ways, but I do remember two times where big moments and I thought just from experience with uh, directors who have to have a, a belief in themselves mm. but maybe don't listen that much to other opinions he came back and actually he's like you know what I I'm gonna go with what you were saying on this and this and I'll I'm gonna put it in the movie and then I'll I want to watch it and see it and to his credit, it, they're both in the movie, wow. and 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 because of that, it goes the other way around. Like now, when he says something, he's like, "I have this totally other idea. You know, why don't you try this?" I don't go, "Oh my God!" But I already did this. So I'm going to dig in my heels, like I was saying. You have to be willing to say, "Maybe this is a, this is a better idea." Yeah. Maybe it's not, and it's all opinion anyway. But all you want to do is help the film, and right. and so so lately, it's been great, kind of having this this upward climb to trying to make music better and make the movie better at the end of the day. Um, and so it's been, it's been great. Yeah. So you were talking about working with uh, John Chu on Crazy Rich Asians. You did yeah. Now You See Me Too with him. Um, talk about, I mean, we're talking about all these relationships and you know, building these friendships. And when he asked you to come on board for this, was there, first of all, was there any hesitation as being a white male right. on this this is a social yeah. it was kind of about representation and it was yeah. about and and you've seen this in the past of course with ludwig on black panther i mean it's not like a, a new thing but it's like being the composer <laughs> and the kind of giving the emotional voice of this was there hesitation right you like oh, should for me I do yeah. this yeah for me not from john yeah you know um it's interesting uh i would definitely it was a topic mm -hmm. that i broached um yeah. but it was kind of like which is so interesting with John is he is a universal storyteller and he just, and he just kind of looked at me like what you know like yeah. like why would that huh and and I think what the movie is so amazing at doing is that it tells you the story with something we've has long been ignored which is we haven't seen an all asian cast comprise all the different aspects of a film. So it's not just like, you know what, we need Asian actors and actresses to portray the good guys. Right. Which, which it, historically, there's been um, racism against certain cultures where they're typed in a certain way. And the thing that really has happened with Asian Americans specifically and also Asian Europeans and, and movies that are made out there, especially in the UK, is that they tended to be marginalized into certain roles. Crazy Rich Asians is great because you have the hero, you have the villain, mm -hmm. you have the, the funny sidekick, you have the smart one, you have the grounded one, you have the leading hunk, you have the, like, all these yeah. things are, are played by an Asian cast because it damn well should be. Yes. That is the yeah. story is how it was written by Kevin. And the, the cool thing is that that John did and he pulled off and the great a actors in the film is that you watch it and in two seconds in you are watching a film. Yeah. No matter what background you are, you're not even thinking about it. No. You realize when you watch it, you go, wow, you know what, this is this actually is a significant and super important movie because of it, it's doing something that, that hasn't been done really in decades. Yeah. At the same time, it is telling a story the best way it can without being 
uh, it's not self-congratulatory. There's no, no, there's nothing about it that is false. It is a totally honest movie. Yeah. And and in that way, they, it, it's really great. And I'm friends with the cast, and I'm friends with pretty much everyone that made the movie. You know, we all know each other. We we really came together to make this labor of love, kind of against all odds, to to make it this this film, and we all put our heart and soul into it. And I it, in that sense. It was the movie making itself was was colorblind, and and um, the thing that I I was probably the one that kind of was thinking about it, and, and you know, uh, of and and really what John would say to me is like, you know what, this he really felt that that I could I could capture the tone that he wanted, which was emerging of a lot of different things, and. He had heard some of my jazz music mm. that I'd done b back in, you know, from 18 years ago or something. A few scores I'd done there. And the fact, like we were saying, we wanted to have a throwback jazz score. And I had just worked with him on Now You See Me Too that I scored. And I have a, this tendency of wearing my heart on my sleeve. I'm very emotional, as everyone that knows me knows. <laughs> uh, and so kind of diving in to the heart of the matter with the story, um, it, uh, we hadn't even decided whether or not I would do it when he showed me the movie. And yeah. he showed me a rough cut of the movie. And it, I almost wasn't even thinking about, gee, what can I do to score this film or anything? I completely, like, it, it so blew me away from emotionally. Like, it's, it's so, I just said, I feel like, I feel like I can tell the story with you, John. If yeah. we do it together, and we can develop this thing and make something very special, um, that uh, that ends up being, you know, definitely one of my most proud moments that I've ever. It's I'm so proud of the film, and I feel it brought out the best in me. And I and I feel even the actors and the way they portrayed their roles brought out the best in me. Um, and and I have my own kind of. I think that's what's great about the movie. I see the movie and I have my parallels to the movie and the storyline and the family and and the the relationships and the and kind of the uh, the struggles that go on in it are different for everybody. But mm -hmm. if, the cool thing is that I think anyone that sees it can identify with someone in no, the it's, movie. It's instantly relatable. Yeah. And it's. I mean, I, when I sat down and was watching it, it's. Uh, the first thing that struck me is not just the big band stuff that you did, but also kind of this kind of sentimental, yeah. uh, really kind of organic, emotional heartbeat of the film. And it just reminded me of the, not just rom-coms, but kind of the dramedies that I grew up watching. Like sure. this is Doubtfire or something like that, where you kind of tap into these kind of serious moments. And there is a lot of fun things too, and it's about having fun, and it's a very fun film. But uh, it's, it, I, think, I think it's funny. I would say... It's been interesting kind of seeing how to categorize the film. Yeah. Because I, uh, to me, when I watched the film, if I didn't read a th lick about it, I just saw the film, to me, I'd be like, okay, it's one-third comedy, one-third romance, one-third drama. Yeah. And, and really, you can break it down. I mean, the last third of the movie is, it is emotionally intense. Yeah. And it's not in a kind of a soap opera-ish type of way. It is done right. in a way that's like, wow... It reminds me, I mean, it's going to be a strange comparison emotionally, tonally, of just the silences and the looks. More like Shawshank Redemption in that last section of the movie where you just, you, it so stays out of the way of these, these scenes and you're just like, it's, it's, it's like you're there and it, it punches you mm -hmm. pretty hard in the gut. And, yeah. and so the fact that you get to laugh and there's so many great lines and situations and and it, it, it's romantic and it looks beautiful like a you know no, just the, a burst of color and yeah. it, the palace the, the fact is you walk away going like wow you know maybe i should call this person that i haven't talked to in 10 years yeah it it, was, it happened this weird and it's thing it's like uh it wasn't overly sentimental it wasn't schmaltzy it wasn't like melodramatic no it, it, it actually it, kind of kept distance exactly in a, in a way was that, that yeah. tricky with the music not yes. to push it to like oh it's too schmaltzy gotta pull it back no yeah in fact it, the the thing that was really cool is that i just I, I would and i and i do that i i often think what should i not do on this one i didn't mm -hmm. i was just like 
I'm not, I'm just going to do what I, I, I feel. And I was actually going through some things in my own life simultaneously. Mm. And I, that is the most kind of from the heart writing I can do. I just sat down, I remember writing the theme and I wrote it on the piano and the, the, the main theme and Astrid's theme and these different ones. And I just sat down and did it and it was totally honest and I knew how I was going to orchestrate it. And I was just hoping that John would agree with, you know, where, with the direction we were going. Yeah. But I didn't, I, I didn't want to write from a perspective of fear where I was thinking, am I going to be intrusive? Am I going to, I, I, I didn't want to kind of cower in the corner. I felt that the, the, the actors pulled it off so well that, that I could say something actively with the music instead of kind of, you know, dialing it down. I could really say something and their performances were so strong that it could handle it. Yeah. And, and then when you have those two things working together, you know, to me, like the, there's been John Williams has done a few of the most impactful moments like that to me. One, the uh, when E.T. leaves, and they're looking up, and it's just the music is. Could could, could you say to John? It could be the same question. There were you, were you afraid of saying too much, or whatever? Yeah. But it, it says everything, and it's, it and I it think says one it of bold. my favorite scored scenes of all yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when we were talking about that, and and there's also uh, the the Isaac Perlman. Uh, solo that comes in at Schindler's List at mm. a very key time. Also, it's right there. You hear, it's not hiding in the corner. You hear that violin. You hear, it, boom, it's right here. There's the main melody. So we, when I was talking about a very, I'm not going to spoil it, but a, a very significant scene at the end of the movie um, with Michelle Yeoh's character and Constant Wu's character, and they're, they kind of have this moment. Yeah. And it's a very significant moment and there's a metaphor there's two layers of that scene and that's where that was the scene to me where it's it's kind of like those to me it was our we actually mentioned it the the scene in ET when it's leaving and <laughs> the emotions really b become strong and it's but it's a it's like a melancholy because it's not some sappy happy moment. It is a it's a tough moment, and it's yeah. so emotional and and stoic. Yeah. The stoicism about it makes just kills me. Like thinking about, it, I get choked up. You yeah. know. And doing the music for it was I, I did I wanted to lean into it and just say you know what it can handle it. Yeah. And I think it does. I think it does too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I want to congratulate on that on the film. It's, it Thank turned you. out so well, you know, and I, I hope people enjoy it, and I yeah. think people will enjoy it. I mean, it's it's fantastic. Yeah, no, I'm I'm I, I'm bowled over by the 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 reaction of people that have seen it, and I think it's just a matter of getting people to see it. Yeah, I've I've been in so many screenings and different things, you know, with with the audiences with that, and people that made you know they'll just come and see the movie, and then the reaction is like, oh my gosh, I didn't know it would be that, you know? Yeah, yeah, and, and it's so and the cast is amazing. They're some of my favorite. Ah. Actors and, and it's just and some are new. I new mean, new actors yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. It's they're, they're they're great from top to bottom, and you know, and definitely, you know, Constance is amazing, and Gemma is amazing, and Henry, who he's never been in a movie. It's I mean, it's insane. He's like you know, he's like Cary Grant in the movie. Yeah, and he could do no wrong. And the crazy thing <laughs> is, I and I'm friends with him, and we've hung out and. Like, like he is that character, by the yeah. way. Yeah. He he, you know, he's he was not at the, the screening he, I went to, and he is that. He's, he's the guy. Yeah. He, and we <laughs> hang out, and you're talking. He's so charming, and he's talking. And the, the thing that I really, I, I always kind of have this litmus test of, am I going to be friends with this person on how they treat staff? I, this is kind of an interesting yeah. thing. No, uh, true. But it, it's this I thing I have. Thing. So, like, busboys or the people that come to take, take the, the waitress or the the you know, the Uber driver, whatever it is. And he's that guy that takes the time to, you know, just talk to people and be so sweet and so mm. nice. And it just makes him all the more charming. And, and it's, it's just ridiculous. He's like, so, <laughs> so it jumps off the screen because he is him. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's uh, uh, shift directions a little bit. You have another pro uh, project that you did uh, with the amazing Taylor Sheridan. Yeah. Yellowstone uh, series for Paramount. And um, Taylor... I mean, he emerged and became one of my favorite writers and now directors. I mean, from Sicario, he yeah. did a screenplay, and then Hell or High Water, and uh, Wind River, and 
and he's I don't know he, I, I'm a Western guy I love westerns yeah me too and um, so to see this resurgence of kind of the modern westerns come back and him planting them in these modern settings I mean Sicario is a western Hill or High Water of course is a western and even Wind River is a western uh -huh. to me and I mean so talk about me getting involved in this project <coughs> because you hadn't worked with him before I'd not um, worked with Taylor before you know. It was another project I'd seen. I, I'm a huge fan of Taylor's, and I'd I'd gotten wind of what he was doing, and um, and I, I I knew that you know if you kind of casually look up me and Spotify, the most listened to things are going to be things that are not the music that would be appropriate for Yellowstone. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of wanted to communicate. Hey, you know what? I, I, he probably isn't thinking of me to score this, but I. I, I could someone just let him know that I would love to just see some of it? Yeah. And I'll, um, and I've, I've written some music that's just, I've done some chamber music outside of film that I've recorded and different things. Uh, just, you know, uh, we could play some of that and kind of kick it around. Mm. And this was like the immediate, okay, we're working together thing. It was like two seconds. Into, I watched like five minutes of it and we talked for a second and I played a teeny bit of music and it was like, it was on. <laughs> It was, it's unusual that that yeah. happened. We were just like, okay, I, we're vibing. This is good. Like, do you want to do this together? And we're yeah. like, yeah, you know. Oh, yeah. wait, I got to call my agent. Oh, yeah, I forgot yeah, about we that. We should sign some papers. Yeah, I know. I, sorry. I, I know I'm not supposed to say yes out of hand, but yes. And, um, and it was so cool the way he shot it. And, and we started, to, he, he's, a, he's definitely a, a cowboy philosopher. philosopher. Yeah. So he doesn't live in town. He's kind of really outside the industry. Uh, and in terms of his attitude, and it's awesome, you yeah. know. And he he drives down here, you know. He's <laughs> he I see him at the at the the stage we're recording, and he's got his spurs on, you know. But he has a really interesting uh, point of view on the world, and it is not necessarily what you would think you know, coming from Texas. Yeah. Uh, definitely. I mean, he he just has he really challenges you just mentally. And he approaches his music kind of philosophically uh, and where we talk about it. Some people kind of have an like, like, uh, empathetic reaction to music where they have to listen to it and, or are impressionistic where mm. they're, I'll kind of listen to some stuff and maybe, uh, yeah, okay, here's my, here's, I'm listening to this and I think it should be kind of like this other thing. He doesn't do that at all. So we started talking about it and somehow I got down the rabbit hole of, Okay, I've seen this. I've seen what he shot, which is you know very wide, kind of removed, mm. you know, uh, shots that go over the plant in Montana and and kind of these shots. Even the way he frames the the ranch and cost, it's like it's done like mythology. Yeah, right. It's not done like like a, 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 a traditional western. It's done more mythologically. It's done like a saga in a way that. Godfather or like a Shakespearean mm -hmm. Henry V is kind of something we talk about. Yeah, um, Richard the Third. These kind of tragedies mi mixed with you know greed becoming your undoing. Every character is gray. There's really, you know, you identify with people, but then you kind of pull that away from you at times when mm -hmm. you're watching it. All these things it just keeps you guessing. So instead of doing the score like straight up Western, as we know, either the the two forms of Western, yeah. kind of Western music, where you have the traditional kind of more Copeland-esque or, the, or mm -hmm. the Americana or the, the, the Spaghetti Western at Marconi kind mm -hmm. of thing. Instead, it was like, well, those are great, but well, let's find a new lane. And the lane was really, even in the Old West, it's, it's old by American standards. And we thought, okay, I think what I want to do is do music kind of delve deep into the style of music that became the Western mm. music. So what is old West music? That's the music of immigrants. Yeah. This music wasn't like invented in the United States, right? right? Like in, in America, these are Irish immigrants. These are people from Turkey, uh, Hungarians that, that played, might have, you know, come from a family that was wealthy at one time and they, they had trained violinists that now two generations down, they need to come to America because they're hard on their luck and they bring a violin in over and it becomes a fiddle, you know? And it's stuff oh, that you can yeah. get in a caravan and travel across the plains with these instruments that come from Turkey, like 
chimbalams that become dulcimers and, and violins that become fiddles and cellos and, and anything you can kind of take with you and play and you, 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 it kind of turned, it, they evolved, accordions, all sorts of stuff. So it's really more kind of, there's a lot of Eastern European influences, almost like uh, I wrote in the style of like Hungarian folk music, like like gypsy music too mm, and yeah. Turkish. And, and, and the thing is when you hear it to the pictures of Montana and the cattle and horses, you kind of get the sense of it being like, oh yeah, I can see this being Western, but there's something a little off about it and mm. chamber music-y and, and like folklorian and, and mythological and old. And I think that goes to the fact that he wrote this as mythology and saga and and um, kind of, it has that tone about it. So the music needed to do that. So sometimes I have the cello play. I used a lot of viola solos, which are the kind of unsung hero of the orchestra playing yeah. that kind of a, sounds like a fiddle but it's darker and then I would do the Philharmonia of London and we would blow it out and these melodies would become big and orchestral mm. for certain shots but it, it became very small or very big epic intimate epic intimate and, 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 of those, yeah, yeah and so the whole score if you notice and you listen to it it's going from like a dulcitone playing the, you know which is this ding keyboard kind of instrument it's an old creaky thing that sounds almost like a celeste and then 10 seconds later, it's a full 80 piece orchestra and then back down to solo viola and then back and forth. So that was the idea is this contrast and history and mythology. And, and so we talked about all this before I wrote anything. I mean, the whole thing we just talked about, we had this discussion. Wow. <laughs> so I went and then I really wrote uh, the main melody for cello solo and recorded that here. I used some weird instruments and Charangos and Berenbaus and even a Belalaika from Russia and all these different things to kind of create these atmospheres and then went and recorded in at Abbey Road in London and then I sent him the theme. He's like, I just want, I want to hear your real vision of the theme. Send me the real deal version. Dive in. Don't worry. I'll protect you. It's going to be fine. I'm protecting your artistic vision. Wow. I'm thinking, oh boy, you know, <laughs> um, and Thank goodness. Uh, that's what the theme is. It's exactly what I wrote. That's and, and it really was a testament to Taylor, one, having trust, but also having this really interesting angle on what music can do in a Western. Right. I mean, his musical taste, I mean, I mean he's went straight for Nick Cave and Warren Ellis for the past ones. And I was like, that's, yeah, uh, those guys are amazing. And then, of course, you. And then it's just like, that's a great. <laughs> yeah. And then Johan had done, you know, oh, Sicario. Sicario yeah. And there's a bit of all of those kind of tones also in what I do on the mm -hmm. show. Like, you know, I, I love all of that music and sometimes it is very atmospheric and has yep. that kind of Icelandic openness and then sometimes it has, you know, more dulcimers and mm -hmm. it, it, but, but it was through that lens of we want to make sure that this music can be traced to the people that immigrated here. Yes, for sure. Another recent thing that you uh, worked on, which I think is very interesting, of course, is the Formula One uh, stuff you, you, you scored for Formula One. Oh my gosh, yeah. Um, um, which is a whole different realm that I want to talk to you about because you have a history with scoring music for sports, and that's you've done yes. for NFL, U.S. Open. Yeah. Um, but talk about Formula One specifically. I mean, you know, as a viewer, we sit down, we watch our NFL Sunday or watch racing, and the yeah. the the, the, tele, the broadcast starts, and the music becomes you know, so iconic and you tie that into it's pretty wild. Whether it's NFL themes or CBS's themes or whatever. But I mean now your themes are part of these worlds. Talk about that approach. Talk about scoring something that isn't film or T V I mean, or game. Yeah. <laughs> Formula One is uh, a, few, a few different things, aspects of it. One, I'm a massive, 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 massive fan. Really? It's the thing that I watch <laughs> the most out of sports. I, I have for twenty years. Where I watch qualification round I watch, on, and it's on Friday, on Saturday I watch, I'm sorry, I watch practice on Friday. I watch quali on Saturday, watch the race. And you, the thing that, if, you, if you're not familiar with Formula One, people go like, what is it a racing thing? What's going on cars? And the thing is, is that they keep it small. So it's, it's just a, if, if, you know, 10 teams or so, depending on the year, with two drivers each, and they don't change out the drivers. So you get to know, and they film before the race, after the race, the race, you hear all the communication and you become totally um, like emotionally mm -hmm. attached like you're watching a series 
like a, your favorite show like for me star trek was always so great because i felt like they were family like yeah. you know you, you every single series i felt i would i you know Picard and Riker and Troy and like all the and you after seven years of watching them you really feel to know them well that's what Formula One is you year after year you're following these drivers and the struggles and the there's all these things that happen as a very dangerous sport sometimes there's tragedies and whatnot and it's it's really exciting viscerally if you if you just watch a race but the thing that's cool is once you get into that drama lane of, yeah of, so and it's it's I think the most viewed televised sport in the world. It actually I think has more viewership than um, football slash soccer. Uh, uh, but they're 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 the two most popular sports in the world, regardless. So on the other hand, it's this huge. I was very aware, having been a Formula One fan, yeah, a, a, of the fanaticism that I have for the sport that all the other fans do. That. No matter what you do, it can be like a lightning rod. It's it, writing the first time there's ever been a Formula One theme written for Formula One. They each each country picked like a song mm -hmm. or something that they would play before the broadcast. Fleetwood Mac in one area, you know, and right. they all worked great. But there was no unifying thing. So this year, you know, Chase came along to to kind of revamp Formula One and and globalize it and and but make it smaller and more intimate. So you could watch in any country and you had the same experience. Really. Yeah, yeah. So, so jumping in, the thing that, so they had no idea was I was even a Formula One fan. I mean, maybe if they really analyzed my Twitter and how much I like uh, making comments, and stuff. <laughs> but, but I don't, I don't think anyone really. I think it was just a surprise. They kind of almost like, oh, you're an American. Formula One's this thing that we did it. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you don't understand. I know, like, I know. yeah, do I get to meet Lewis Hamilton? And, and I ended up, I ended up meeting these drivers, Fernando Alonso, and like uh, world champions like Mika Hakkinen and David Coulthard, who I'm friends with now. <laughs> um, it's insane. So, um, the, the, so, so that's all very exciting. But um, the, I, I felt like I really did understand the the drama aspect. It couldn't be just like a you know, like an action theme. Yeah. Or like a, it needed to be really emotional. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to the theme, it has this build and kind of cadence and a, uh, a melody, but then it has this really emotional middle because we've all, you know, I, I started watching when Senna had, uh, was I was only a few races in and he, he died. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was the, for Americans, he was like, it would have been like the Michael Jordan, it'd be like Michael Jordan actually dying on the court wow. in the middle of a Chicago Bulls game. Yeah, and it devastated Brazil. I mean, it was like the most. It was. It was like it. And and these kind of things happen. And so we know they're taking these risks. And so when I wrote the theme, I asked the Formula One people to send me over archival footage of of kind of the last thirty. 40 years of Formula One, all these highs and lows. I didn't just want the highs. I wanted the, yeah. the lows. So half of the theme is written to tragedies, and that and 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 then the triumphs are kind of higher. And so there's this massive emotional arc to it. And now that I see how the reaction has been, it's been so amazing hearing every week from Formula One fans that just write me. You know, it's a whole new audience. They're yeah. not film fans. It's a, they just say, look. This theme means more to them. Like, it's so amazing to see how much of a part of their lives it is. How, like, they make little videos of themselves dancing to it, like, as the racist. Or, or you know, they so it, it, and it be, it's because I think, I, I, it's because I am one of them. Yeah. That, that I got that this needs to be all about emotion. And, um, and so I just lean into it <laughs> as well. And it's like... Here I go, and and I'm at the mercy of the fans now to see if they like it, and uh, so I've been really fortunate that it's turned out very well. And in, of course, it'll be different than what you did for NFL, and of course, the right. US Open. But yeah. I mean, that's a whole. It's just I, I find it fat because nobody talked. Even John Williams, uh, Sunday Night Football. That's his uh, yes team. And um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's um and. and and I love football, and I yeah. love. It, but this is different, you know. Yeah, it's um, very different. And. <laughs> And and it, it's 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 I think it's because it's so few people like doing it like so you you see their faces and you get like you Lewis Hamilton it, 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 all of a sudden he's racing for a country yeah so now England every time he's out there, and if he 
something happens after 72 laps and he's leading and then it, something happens and he goes off and he loses position and then Sebastian Vettel, who's from Germany, yeah. gets ahead and all of a sudden Germany's, you can hear the whole country like, ah, <laughs> and then like the the crushing, you know, and this, the, the thing that I find is, is similar, the only thing I can really relate it to would be World Cup, where the whole country gets behind yeah. and, and, and like literally it's it's like, if you don't watch it and you're not into it, you don't get the emotional devastation that happens right. when it, it, it goes wrong yeah. and it'd be barely, and you're just like, oh my God. And, and you all, so when you're watching F1 and you watch it for, and you get into it, it's like that. And yeah. so, so I try to capture that. It's not about the speed and the, like. No, it's a, there's, yeah. and every sport has, every sport is, and people, that's why people watch it. I think it's, there is a narrative there that people aren't aware that. Yes. You're watching a narrative unfold in front of you and you just don't know how that will it, end. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. It, it, it just, it kind of lends itself especially to it. Yeah. Um, because so much can go wrong. Yeah. So much can go wrong so quickly. In most sports, you you when you throw in reliance on kind of uh, the, the 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 unknown, which is engines and rain, and is someone else going to run into you. Like there's it, your 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 fate is it's like the sword of Damocles is hanging over your head. You, I mean, I, the first, I, Lewis Hamilton, just kind of to speak on Lewis Hamilton, when he was a rookie, first year out, not only he's the, the, the first person uh, uh, that came into it at this age, first black driver, first, all these firsts, the guy's a ninja, he's out there, he is having the most heroic season, <laughs> he, his teammate is like world champion and he is in the lead for the whole championship and you've gone through 70 laps per race through 22 races for like nine months and you're there and all he needs to do is finish I think third in this race and he wins the championship that's all he has to do <laughs> and he is battling with like two laps left he, he, he could relinquish for second place in a race Kimi Raikkonen and they're going like this and he could have just let him go and he could have won the championship. Just let him go. And he was just fighting and he freaking go and I'm rooting for him and he goes off and into the fence. And that was it. And the it was like 221 points to 221 points for the whole season and the tiebreaker was broken because oh of a technicality. God. So he lost. Now you go through that whole year yeah. and you have it right there. Cut to the next year, the last race. Same thing. He has to finish at a certain certain point level. Same thing. But he's stuck in, I think, sixth place in the race. He needs to finish fifth. And it starts raining. And he can't get around Sebastian Vettel. And it's now, it looks like, it's same thing. He's going to lose the whole championship by one point two years in a row. And I'm watching this going, you know, like, <laughs> what the? And this is my guy, right? Yeah. And, and and it just happens to be, and this will never happen in sports history again, on the last turn of the last race, the last corner, he gets ahead and wins the race by 100 feet and wins the championship. <laughs> and youngest driver ever to win it, wow. world championship. And I went back and I watched that race when I was riding. That's the amazing. Theme, and that kind of inspired me to, you know, that kind of intensity and emotion. Yeah, you know, wow. <laughs> you know, <laughs> No, I mean story time. It's it. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's, it's that uh, that passion that I mean you just show that's that's sports fans and yeah. and especially for me I love football and and people don't realize that I, I just bought the complete like forty years of NFL film. Oh music. yeah, yeah. No, I I go back to this. Oh, yeah. Sam yeah. Spence, totally. like I mean, look at that the, the richness of the music. In I the love sports. Uh, it, yeah, all yeah. that stuff that was shot on film is awesome. Yeah, it's yeah, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Looking forward, uh, or going kind of back to kind of an overall talk, uh, you know, you, we've talked about all the <coughs> projects that you currently worked on. Yeah. You're a composer, you're in the spotlight, you're putting your work out there. Um, I want to talk about criticism and how you handle yeah. criticism from uh, fans. I mean, not, not professional criticism, but maybe just like... Yeah, just people. Just people in general. I mean, you're a social guy, you're on social media. Yeah. And uh, do you embrace it? Do you block it? I mean... Um, you know, I... I see it and it's kind of like I'm not immune to it. Yeah. You know, uh if someone has a, a honest 
disagreement about your music. It's like, I don't like your melodies. I don't think, I think you did something you did before. I don't think you're repeating yourself. Whatever, that's fair. Mm -hmm. It's the weird stuff that's personal. That's like, it, it kind of just bothers me in the sense of like, you know, it's, it's when you, you don't expect it to be directed to you. Because I, when I, when I started, of course, I mean, I just happy writing music. Yeah. I feel lucky. You know what I mean. So I think people think that you're somehow not human. Mm -hmm. If somehow, if you are in media, like you've done something where now you're in the public sphere. Yeah. So you're fair game for all sorts of crazy weird stuff, like, like bonkers stuff. Mm -hmm. So so on, ninety nine percent is totally fair game, good or bad. Most of it's positive. The stuff that's <laughs> negative, I can totally. No problem. It's that one weird 1% that, that talks about things that have nothing to do with music yeah. or, or it just it's irrelevant to the music. Uh, like I saw, it, it, see, I'll give you an example. Like it's just like, did you do any, did you even think before you just went, wrote this? There was, this kind of sticks out. So, you know, we were just talking about how into live music and how I, I, I want to record this music like as if it was 1945 and we mm -hmm. could, you know, and I'm, I'm such a proponent of live music. I play like a ton of live instruments and I learn acoustically and I, my kind of my campaign is anti-computer. So I see like online some guy that's like, I'm going to do a movie and it was announced and people were like, yeah, Brian Tyler's going to do it. And then some guy's like, what the hell? He's gonna do this movie. This guy's like, all he just he just uses synthesizers, you know, or something like, you know, I this needs an orchestral score. It's like, what? it's not that it like it makes me. Oh, oh, yeah, look no. at that. It's not that it makes me mad. It just makes me think like, uh, you know, it's just weird, yeah. you know. And, and then and that's that's kind of a specific thing about getting music wrong. And then if they get personal about your life which people do, and I get instant messages and direct messages that you wouldn't, well, you probably would believe it. it right. It's as it's just crazy, and, and some people, um, they feel like they know you, and they get, they get possessive and then kind of turn on you because you're not answering, but it's like, some people are a little maybe unhinged, all that stuff, criticism, whatever. So when I see something that, um, the thing that I, I, I don't value is um, a lack of effort to be informed on what you're talking about. Yeah. So if someone honestly like listens to my music and they're like, I just don't like it, I think it's terrible. Mm -hmm. Great, fine. But you can tell when someone kind of didn't even like bother. Yeah, you know, for sure. And they'll just say something you're like, eh, that has a couple of things you can tell. It's like that ticks me off in the sense that like uh, in the same way I get annoyed at people that will be anti-science and go on and just start chirping away and oh you know it's like talking to flat earthers you know like yeah, it's just yeah. annoying that you're like oh god people still exist like they like like just just at least be informed yeah when you come to the, you know to the mean? table yeah and i'm yeah, sure yeah. that i just got, I'll, i will get from this, I guarantee you, I will get eight to ten emails from flat earthers, and I get the I, I, I've I've gotten emails of people saying I got a, a bunch of I said something about what was it like Noah's Ark one time, <laughs> <laughs> and kind of like well I'm like it's absurd like and I gave it as like an analogy yeah I got a ton of people they're like I'm your fan I really love what you do. So don't, you know, but I just want to tell you that Noah's Ark happened and all the animals of the world were on this boat and all 58 million and they can fit because you do this and you have things and don't worry about sewage because in the thing with the, and I'm just like, what, you know, so, so no matter what I do, and, and, and they were actually friendly. It was not. Yeah, they, they weren't attacked. They but, but then, then again, beliefs. I remember when I did that, I got it. I got a video <laughs> from this, this guy that was like. I did this whole video about how I'm gonna go to hell. Wow. Yeah, and it was like that's it was like priceless. yeah, it was naming me in the video and just like just you know, just you're gonna burn forever and you're gonna deserve it because and it's like whoa, like you know that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Criticism is fine, but like if you if you wish for me because I might come from a different 
point of view than you if you wish for me to be tortured for all eternity. I just feel like it's going too far. <laughs> You know, maybe I'm crazy and maybe I shouldn't take it personally. I, you know, but uh, it's, it's just, it's, it's weird. You think like most people, you know, like are empathetic, you know, yeah. someone like hurts, trips over, you know, a sidewalk and they hurt their, you know, and you're, oh my God. And you feel like, oh my God, I feel so, but there's certain people out there, there's a small percentage that just, they're assholes, <laughs> you know? And so, it's true. so, so and, it's and, true. And, and the thing about social media now, as you kind of say today, the, the thing that's a little... A little scary is that the, the, the scary part about it is that um, I mean wh I've kind of thought of this before. I don't know if we've ever talked about this. What do you think the percentage of people that are actually batshit crazy out there? Just like is it like like just out of yeah, uh, one out of a thousand, one out of five hundred? Yeah, sure. But let's say one out of five. Okay, sure. so say so you have like. Maybe uh, more, but I'm so Oh, like, say, they see, right? Right, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so one out of 500, right? Um, and, um, uh, you know, <coughs> let's say um, you're just cruising along, doing your thing, like, you know, composer, or you're an actor, whatever you are. Yeah. Um, um, you know, you have 100,000 followers or a million followers or whatever. Right. Now, y you're talking about... Uh, you know, a, a 0.5 percent. You know, of the po it sounds small until you start multiplying it by 100,000 people, yeah. right? So even if it was, it was so, so you're talking about like 200 people yeah. plus that follow me. That if this we're right about the numbers, that are absolutely crazy people that maybe have are dangerous or whatever it is. So all it takes is like two or three to really hassle you. Yeah. And, and get, so when you're talking about a few hundred, you you, you do you do encounter that stuff, yeah. and um, and you just kind of have to let it go. And I know this is a different category than criticism. Mm -hmm. The thing about real criticism that I love is that I've learned from criticism from musicians where we talk critically about music. You know yes, what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to really see it. I haven't really learned a whole lot, like from Instagram or Twitter, where people are like, you know, you really should use a dominant chord. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't get a lot of that. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think I've ever learned. It. I, I've learned about cool stories about how maybe my music touched someone, or you know, yeah. I've, I've heard a lot of amazing. We got married to your music. My father loved your music, and we had a memorial with him. I've actually. You know, um, my music, I mean, it was actually part of Paul Walker's memorial, actually. Yeah. Was, um, and, and so these things, when it actually affects people's life, I learn, oh my gosh, music is powerful. I'm not just doing this in a vacuum. Yeah. But I don't know if I technically learn that much. It's more like talking to musicians where they'll be like, yo, I heard this thing that you posted. It was uh, the theme from such and such movie. That's super cool. Have you ever thought of da-da-da-da-da? Mm. I'm like, oh, no, I haven't. And, uh, you know, and... and in that way, criticism is very, very healthy. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I bring it up because I've lately just, at least from online, I've seen this kind of hate kind of really latching onto people. And, and Lauren was a victim of that for Mission Impossible and, yeah, yeah. and on the forums and stuff like that. And I think, especially people who are us all judging music out of context, I think people forget that, oh, for sure. that you are scoring to picture. And not the album is not, uh, yeah. they're criticizing the album. And, and I'm just like, the album is that's, 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 it's that's, a bonus thing that comes a, out yeah, of it's it. It's great that it exists. Yeah, but it's not yeah. what you're writing it for. You can get also kind of a bandwagon thing going where people mm -hmm. just kind of say shit and, and mm -hmm. they just talk trash. I think, unfortunately, right now, there's a bit of a part of that in society. I think where we've gone as a country, um, unfortunately, in the last year and a half, is the is uh, the angerifying and the mean yeah. mean streakness where it becomes okay to bully yeah. and to to just yeah. is normalized where yeah. you just kind of say oh you're an idiot oh you're a low IQ person this yeah. person is this oh you're low energy we're the and it becomes like a it, it, you you kind of see it at the top and I think unfortunately I'm worried that a younger generation sees that and it's like oh it's okay for for this. It's okay for him or whatever. Yeah. Maybe I should do that. And you see online 
commenting, getting more and more trolly yeah. and more and more, yeah. I want to troll someone, just upset them. What the hell is that? Yeah. Like, you know, and I've seen people where you see an article about someone that has died of cancer or something, a, a celebrity, and you see the comments and every few, you'll see comments that are just there to hurt. Yes. Like, this yeah. person had a family, what are you doing? And, and that has seeped into the music, online, criticism, community, and I'm just sincere about it. Mm -hmm. uh, do I respond? I have, uh, but it's usually like, I'm sorry you didn't like my, my music. Yeah. You know, but it's, and I'll even, I'm sorry you wouldn't listen to my music because you have some prejudgment about who I am for whatever reason, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, when I see it about other composers, I, I definitely, um, you know, that, that when it's not honest criticism, when yeah. it's just trolling, it, yeah. it, it bothers me. It yeah, yeah you, I would never, you'd never see somebody have a meal and not like the food and go into the kitchen and sh trash the chef, you know? Like, no, and you see that. Piece and, of shit. Yeah, and, <laughs> like, and, <I> mean, <laughs> and, and I see that with movie criticism too. I yeah, think people go dead. overboard. You know, you may like, and you see a bandwagoning where it's like, Really? Oh. And, and especially on movies that people are particularly fans of, they can be the oh, harshest yeah, with like course. Star Wars or whatever. Star Wars, Mission Impossible, these it, big ones. Yeah, yeah when, 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 when it's like something that people hold true to, I think they feel licensed where it's just like, like, I think it's a lot easier to, to be negative than it is to be positive. It's, it's, like, it's, it's just an easy look because it, I think people think it makes them look smarter. It does. It has a superior, su superior, superiority yes. thing. Where it's so like, I'm like, I am no better yeah. than you that you have done this. Yes. But I know better. I know better than you, director of whatever movie. Yes. I would have done, really? Yeah. Do you know how hard it is? Every movie is a small miracle. Anything, the fact that it is on not, the screen, yeah. Yeah, it's it's altering reality. You're sitting in a theater clearly in a chair and you're supposed to be transported into space. Yeah. And believe it. <laughs> and and like 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 anyway, and, and so in in the, the process of writing a score is very difficult. You don't sleep. You have a lot of challenges. You need to serve a million different, uh, different yeah. you know, masters, but at the same time do something artistic and, and say something. And it's very challenging. So you kind of just see people in one sentence kind of say, oh, that's blah, blah, blah. And it's just kind yeah. of like, th that's not helpful to yeah. anyone, I don't think. And I feel like I try to be very positive and I really try to let people know, hey, I, I really enjoyed that. And I tell a lot, i constantly reaching out to composers to tell yeah. them, you know, and... Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's me. So, uh, just looking at the future, I saw on IMDb that you have, uh, what, men want? Is that, have you, have yes. you signed on to that? That's uh, going to be an interesting twist on what women want. Yeah, so, so <laughs> it's from, it's the, the reverse perspective. It's the female perspective on this, which is great. And, uh, uh, you know, it's so funny. And Adam <laughs> Shankman directed it. And, um, you know, it's it's from Paramount, and mm -hmm. the thing the thing that's interesting is this. I think is, you know, kind of goes along the lines of what we we're talking about. Wanting to do something different and out of the box. Yeah. And that one is a is a comedy, and it's like a full on comedy, you know. And so it's very different than Crazy Rich. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, and it's very different from Yellowstone. It's very different from, you know, Thor and Fast and Furious, and so so it's it's. It's an opportunity to really do something fun, and I, and I love Adam, and he's he's very musical. I mean, he's he's a basically a director of musicals. Yeah, yeah, I know. and he's a choreographer, and and he's he he's did, so uh, great. Hairspray, yes, and uh, Rock of Ages. Yep, 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 yeah, yeah, totally, and uh, super talented, and he knows his stuff, you know. So that's gonna be that's gonna be a lot of fun. <laughs> Anything else that you can talk about that you can? Reveal? Yeah, I mean, coming right up, we <laughs> I just did the the. Uh, the pilot for Magnum P.I., bringing that back. Right. And we're bringing back the Mike Post theme, which is so great. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, no worries. <coughs> Mike Post always makes me... Oh, no, I'm, I'm good friends with Mike. He, he's, he's, he's great. And it's, uh, Pete Carpenter, you know. And So I'm doing that with Keith Power. We, do the tra we did the, uh, the theme. Mm -hmm. we're doing it all live. Again, live music, live brass, live strings, you know, the classic theme. And then the, 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 tra the uh, pilot was directed by Justin Lin, who directs... Yeah. You know, we've done a bunch of movies, and he's Star Trek, and he's Fast and Furious, and I'll be teaming up with Justin as well on the, he's coming back to the Fast and Furious franchise, yes. which is which is fantastic. <laughs> and uh, I did this uh, epic kind of fantasy game called uh, Lost Ark that is, oh, wow. it's like, 
Lord of the Rings meets Star Wars, it, and it's, it's one of my favorite scores I've ever done, and, and did full choir and orchestra. I mean, it is, it's as big as I've ever gotten. So that one is, it was fun to be doing kind of at the same, it was right before Yellowstone and, and Crazy Rich, actually. And now we're just doing mixes for it, so there's kind of a gap. Yeah. While other, like, they developed my themes into other parts of the game with other composers. But there's going to be this, uh, this, the main soundtrack is really a lot of fun, and we, we, we really had fun recording it in London. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I just want to thank you again, Brian, for absolutely time and for yeah. awesome Thanks chats. For I always have fun chat chatting with you. Right on. And um, congrats on everything so far. So. Thanks. I'll, I'll come back in a, maybe another year and we'll catch up again. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. <laughs> See ya.